Good morning. Good morning. Welcome here. Um, so I got a little buddy, so you don't have to bear with me. Um, so I'm going to do the announcements and the call to worship. So next Sunday is the uh, lunch bunch where we're going to go to Paradise Acres after church. Uh, Todd is going to be doing a trip to Emerald Point with the youth this coming Friday. They're going to leave at 9 o'clock. If you have any questions, you need any information, it's on Facebook, or you can also text him. Um, VBS is coming up right around the corner. Um, that is August 7th through the 9th. And it's from 6 to 8.30. Uh, there is a planning meeting this Thursday at 6 p.m. if you want to help or volunteer with that. Um, you can look at our prayer list, keep those people in our prayers, um, and then anniversaries through this week. Um, is Lawrence and Betty Burke on the 25th. So happy anniversary to y'all. Is there anybody else that has any other announcements that I'm missing? Yep. After worship today, 150th anniversary committee meeting. Hopefully it won't be too long. Fellowship. Fellowship Hall. Church. After worship, church directories are here. After worship, see Robin in the conference room. In the conference room, see Robin in the conference room. <laughs> if you have paid for a directory, you can pick up the directory. You need to pay for the directories. They are fifteen dollars. As I said, the reason they're we it's costing fifteen dollars per directory is because not enough people ordered packets of photos after they had their photos taken that are in the directory. People don't do things for free, so they had to make some money. So the directories are $15. And um, those who have ordered those who have paid, you can see Robin afterwards in the conference room down the hallway on the left. The back... Baptist men, um, fair ministry work is coming up. Uh, it's going to be August the 31st, which is this time on a Saturday. We're going to be out at the fairgrounds from 12 until 4. And we're asking, you know, if you'd like to come out and help, that's fine. But what we're looking for is uh, hygiene products, you know, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, soap, and um, some slightly used clothes that you don't want anymore um, that we can give away to, to those um, it's been a good ministry, and um, we just, we're just going to continue to do that. That's all I got. It's still on? Okay. okay. Now we're ready to the call of worship. Uh, Y'all can respond or read responsibly. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. Not endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Please stand and join the praise band in singing Victory in Jesus. They sing. I heard an old story about a saint who came from the Lord. I gave his life to Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his drowning, but his precious blood was only. Then I repented of my sins and wonder. 
Bow your heads and pray with me, please. Lord, we come before you today and we give thanks for all the blessings that you have given to us. <clears throat> Many times in our lives are filled so full of busy work that we neglect our relationship with you. Draw us close to you with thankful hearts, knowing you never neglect us. Through the victory in Jesus, we know who holds our tomorrows. A tomorrow of eternal life with you because of the blood that was shed by Jesus. Blood that was shed for our transgressions, we give thanks. Be with us now as we gather in your name. Draw us close to you. May we feel your presence among us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may remain seated for this one. This is a new song. Um, the first time singing through, it give you an idea what the melody is. When we repeat it, verse 1, we would like just the ladies to sing. Verse 2, just the men to sing. And in the chorus, we will all join in, join in again together to the end. But this is called Draw Me Close to You. Nothing else 
meant for me to be a deacon. The Lord calls us to be hands and feet for Christ. And I feel as a deacon that that is one of the things that we are. We are hands and feet of Christ. Being there <clears throat> for families when they've lost a loved one. Showing up at a house with a guitar and a, and a voice the little bit of talent that God gave me is humbling, is gratifying, is um, it makes you feel good because you see the smile on their faces. Just being a shoulder for church family to cry on in times of need. Um, being there to help um, do things that need to be done in the church is gratifying, is humbling and is worthy of our Lord. It's just hard sometimes to put into words what it is to be a deacon, especially when you, you go to visit folks in their home in their times of need, because I think that's one of the most important things that a deacon does as, as, a, as being the hands and feet of Christ is being there for people in their time of need. And as I said, it's been, it's been um, an honor and a pleasure to have been your a deacon now for my fourth year. I'll be rotating off shortly. But it is a very uh, re rewarding and humbling 
service to be a deacon. If God puts it on your heart to become a deacon, you will not be sorry for it. Because your people, God's people, sometimes puts, it, puts that on your heart to, to be a servant to other people. Because that's what deacons are. We are servants to our church family and to our church family in times of need. And, and in times of joy also. Not just in times of need and sorrow, but also on the mountaintops when there's things to celebrate. But being a deacon is definitely an honor to serve God's people. Thank you.
Good morning again, everybody. Um, again, my name is Sammy Sibbett, and uh, Todd Paget is a good friend of mine, but also a mentor of mine, and also served on my ordination committee many years ago. So we have a very special relationship, and I was honored that he asked for me to come speak here today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my passion. Y'all might have noticed the title, so I wanted to kind of tell you to start with what a couple of my passions are, and that is church coaching, helping churches uh, evolve, continue to grow or stop the decline and start regrowing. That's a passion, but also the unchurched are a passion too, a passion as well. Um, so. Some of this scripture is very familiar, and I wanted to say that this is all in a coaching type atmosphere, things that can be general. So when I say the church, I'm not talking about this church, okay, necessarily, okay? Just talking about many, many churches, okay? All right. And one of our scripture texts that we have, and again, I'm in uh, the NIV, I mean the New King James Version is, let's see here, Matthew chapter 22. No, no, no. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look at a plank is in your own my eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Okay, this is about judgment, right? This text is probably very familiar to many of us. We have probably heard many sermons about not judging. And I would imagine if you go back through your memory banks, you probably hear this sermon about once a year, probably. And if you've been going to church for quite a while, different churches, different denominations, or even this church, you probably heard this scripture preached different kinds of ways, very passionately, angrily, like the pastor, don't judge, don't judge, I mean mad, right? You're like, whoa, pastor, calm down, okay? You might have heard it pleading, please don't judge anybody, you know, well, however you heard it, right? So it's very familiar, so I'm not going to revisit going back through it, but I would like to do like a, like a little summary here because I'm going to refer back to it as far as what we're talking about with judgment, because it is very confusing, and church people, uh, as church people, we get kind of confused about it. We claim, one of the things we like to say, or I hear fellow Christians say all the time, is that they say, I don't judge anybody. I don't judge nobody. Well, one thing I will say, though, 
better understand why it's confusing is because judgment is only a dirty word in this setting, okay? Judging things is not actually that big a deal. I mean, we don't get mad if someone's judging the cake contest, right? It really means to make a decision. It was the best judgment for us to, whatever the case may be, put our child in this school or that preschool or whatever the case may be. So it's only in this term. And we, we, so it's confusing, but in this context, we might be thinking that judgment would be that God is reserving the right for not only ultimate judgment, right? He's the one that decides, not us, who is going to heaven. But it also might be it's not our decision who is worthy of God's love. Okay? God loves all His children, right? So God loves everyone. So it might not be our decision to make about who He loves or not. It's kind of in that context as far as that goes. And I was going to uh, actually offer up a second scripture, but I know my friend Todd very well. Hmm. In other words, in reverend world, he's a God is love guy. He's probably telling you all the time how much God loves you. I've heard people that said, I just get sick of it. I want to be beat up in church. I, well, anyway, the point of the matter is, is that my friend is a God is love, and I'm, I'm kind of there with him. I'm sorry, guys, so this is not going to be a, you know, where I'm going to just beat you apart. I'm sure really not going to do that today because I'm... I, he, he loves everybody. The only thing that really doesn't make no sense is how much God loves us. He still does, yes. We all got things we've done. Still loves us. It don't make no sense, but he does. It's, it's a unique kind of love, right? The love that God has for us. And that's where I was going with the, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 39. Tell you what, every time I get up here and have to flip through the Bible, I always think about the kids that do Bible drill, Right? I'd have been like last place. I didn't grow up in church, ironically, but I'd have been in last place. These kids, if y'all have ever been to a Bible drill, amazing what they can do. But it takes me a minute. So anyway, let's see here. We are at... Boy, I've got this highlighted a bunch of times in here. When Jesus was asked about what are the most important commandments, there again, my buddy is telling me that y'all get hit with this about once a month. And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, just to sum up, Kind of not our decision who God loves or goes to heaven. So he just took us right out of that equation. And then he gives us a pretty clear blueprint of who we are to love. Everybody. That's our job. There we go. That's our job. Now, I mentioned earlier that, you know, my passion, um, church growth, the unchurched, and how to, I wanted to mention a little bit about my own personal journey. Um, grew up unchurched. I'm not going to go unpack a whole lot of that stuff, but um, early in my church career, if so, I would describe myself when I did come to church. I was an 11 to 12, right? 11 to 12, you know what I'm saying? Um, 11 to 2, 11 to 3, 11 to 4, whatever, you know. And definitely, you know, one of those guys, if the pastor's running a little bit long, you know, you did the old look at the watch deal, right? Hey, it's time to eat there, pastor. You know what I'm saying? We want to get in line before, you know, the food gets cold, whatever the case may be. But that was definitely me, for sure. And uh, the church I was going to at that time, and I've been there for a while, doing my part. I was there for count, you know, most of the time. I definitely made it in by count, you know what I'm saying, by the time we do the count. But anyway, we got us a brand new young pastor. Once upon a time, I was younger, a little younger than me but still in the same age group, and he was from Indiana. He came in to a little church in North Carolina and didn't really know anyone, and we struck up a friendship. Uh, we're friends to this day, as a matter of fact. 
Uh, he spent quite a while in North Carolina and now is back as a, a senior pastor in a church in Indiana. His name is Dr. Danny Russell. Yes, the young man had a doctorate in theology, one of the most brilliant people in the world. He became, came on board, was a brand new pastor. I befriended him. And so Danny came in as a brand new pastor to an older church, on fire, wanting to try to do things. And one thing he wanted us to do was to go to a big church conference with workshops, right? So he talked a little bit about it. I'm 11 to 12. or didn't really pay that much stock. Yeah, I ain't paying no attention. Till Danny, of course, he had a cell phone number. We go to lunch. He goes, Sammy, will you go with me to this church conference? And I was like, uh. And then he says, no one in the whole church will go with me. And I hate to go by myself. I'm like, ah. Uh. And here's, here's my inner monologue, right? Church conference. Sounds boring, right? I mean, my goodness, a bunch of stiff people. You know what I mean? I was just picturing all better than me. I wouldn't fit in. Just sounds terrible. You know, like a terrible idea. The worst idea, you know. But this is my friend. He's the new pastor. At least we'll get to hang out. So, you know, I never told Danny this unless he watches this on video sometime or whatever. But, yeah, I didn't really want to go, Danny. Sorry, buddy. But anyway, <laughs> he carried me there, and I was surprised. It was fun. We had a great time. The workshops, amazing. You got to pick which workshops you went to. And I'd been going to the church long enough to realize that the congregation was on the downhill, okay? Because the sanctuary would hold 350 people. We were looking at hopefully trying to get 50 in there. You know, it was no problem. Sometimes a family got a whole pew, you know, that kind of situation. So the church was definitely going downhill. So, sorry, I get the dry mouth. So anyway, one of the names of the workshops, I'd never been there before, is How to Grow a Dying Church. Something like that, right? So I was like, well, sign me up. And I go to this uh, workshop, and I'm introduced to a gentleman named Eddie Hammett. Eddie Hammett. Um, never heard of him. A lot of y'all might be, or all of y'all might be like, Eddie Hammett. Mm, don't know him. Don't know him. Well, to my surprise, I'm pretty sure that I noticed Eddie's got at least seven best-selling Christian books. A certified church coach. He might have eight by now. There's no telling with Eddie. Uh, doctorate of theology, you name it. Hundreds and hundreds of papers published in the Christian world. You know, it's one of those things where if you follow baseball, you probably know the stars of baseball. If you're deep into Christianity and literature and stuff, then you know who Eddie Hammond is. But, amazing to me how awesome Eddie was and he was willing to express, you know, and talk about what he had learned. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about Eddie there at the end. So, we're talking about the church and the unchurched, right? Why aren't people coming to church? <laughs> Interesting. And how do we change those dynamics? Well, Eddie had talked about something that was very interesting to me, and he talked about for someone that we need to stand in the gap. We need folks to step up and stand in the gap. Standing in the gap can be a lot of different things, but in this situation, we're talking about We've got, a, we got us church people over here. We're church people. And then we got the unchurched people. Now, both of these crowds, if you will, can be very vocal about their side of it. That is correct. We are not churched, and we don't want to have nothing to do with that bunch of hypocrites or whatever the case may be, blah, 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 blah. Okay? But, and then we got us, well, let's just say we're welcoming to everybody. We, we love everybody. We don't judge anybody. That's what we say. Let's hope that's what we're doing. But anyway, let's just stick with that story, okay? It's our, our narrative on this one. But standing in the gap is when you're kind of served in between the two worlds because we got church, unchurched, but then we got God everywhere loving who? everybody if we're coming to this church and we're part of his kingdom we kind of 
work for him, right? So if we're working for God, then that means we need to be helping who? Everybody. Okay. So it was a very interesting concept to me. Of course, he gave many examples about how you could do it. And then, you know, I, I, I say enough that look for learning outside of just Todd. I love him to death. And he is a wealth of information. And if you get him in his office, he will just open up, okay? He knows, he knows all this stuff ten times more than me. Uh, but he's got to be careful because he's on the payroll. <laughs> I'm messing with I'm messing. I'm messing. But no, Todd is a great resource. You've made, a, you've made the right pick. Somebody in here might be, I don't know. That. Well, you've made a good pick. Okay, you've made a good pick. He's an all-star. No two ways about it. But for me... So I went to the conference, and I'm still an 11 to 12-er type person. And what was interesting to me, though, as far as my Christian journey in the ministry, was when someone come to me and asked me, says, Sammy, would you do a funeral for us? We in fact, the gentleman, I, I knew the gentleman that they'd lost his brother. Now, I said, well, that is an honor, but, you know, I'm not a minister I'm not qualified. They said, well, you're probably, the, and this was his word, sure weren't mine. Here's his words. Well, you're like the best Christian that we know, which is sad, right? Sad. 11 to 12 is the best Christian they know. And we know you, we feel comfortable with you. I said, well, I've got to make a phone call first. I said, let me make a phone call. So I called my mentor, Mr. Dr. Danny Russell, right? And I say, Danny, I've been asked to do a funeral. Can I even do it? Now, he starts laughing because he thinks it's just funny. He just thinks it's funny. Can, can I do a funeral? You know? And he weren't like whether I could do it or not. I'm talking about whether it was legal. You know what I'm saying? Could I even do it? And then he said, Here, here's the rule of thumb, Sammy. When you're, you're actually ordained deacon, because I was a deacon at that time. Uh, he says, you can bury him, just can't marry him if you're not an ordained minister. So he thought it was funny. So anyway... As far as my journey, it started, I started with a funeral. Started with a funeral. Now, y'all might be sitting back there, whatever. My goal is, during a funeral, is I want the whole crowd, if I can, to laugh three times. Yes, when I meet with the family, I know it's somber, it's sad, it's a funeral. You can imagine. And I was thinking on the way here, I don't think that I have done a funeral where the age was above mid 50s most of these have been accidents younger people uh it's been sad and it's tough but when i sit down with with the with the family I, here's what i ask the family and they're somber you can imagine i say okay of course i say the formalities and i say will you t please tell me the funniest story that you have about your loved one and i'll ask everybody what is the funniest If you can get folks to laugh at a funeral, when they go from crying to laughter, it's an amazing thing. The it, water will pour, pour out of them because they start stop focusing on the loss for a minute, start thinking about the goodness and the greatness of, that their loved one brought to their life, right? So, that was my part, standing in the gap. And I, I was on a roll with funerals, which is not exactly, I, weren't, I advertised None of them. I advertise nothing at all, period. As far as doing, ask to do weddings, come speak at churches, whatever the case may be, fill in preaching, whatever the case may be. I don't ask for any of it, but I try to be obedient to God, right? So through this course of doing this, sometimes folks at funerals started to think that I was a pastor, which I was not an ordained pastor at the time. But I heard the call from God and... I did not have time, nor have time, to go take four years of seminary. So I did the best I knew how to do, which was to form an ordination council, eight members, a lot of doctorates on there, and it took me, took me over a year. You know, and the first time the council asked me to write a paper, I was like, it's going to be homework. Homework? You young guy, you know what homework is. I didn't want to do no homework. I didn't want to do it when I was 12. I sure didn't want to do it when I was in my 40s, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, that's led to other things, and I have been doing more weddings than funerals, and they're a lot more fun, trust me, to do a wedding than a funeral. 
and speaking. And that is how I met Todd eventually was speaking. And I'd mentioned Eddie Hammett. Now one thing when I work for God, normally I'm very passive, just want to get along and everything. But when I work for God, I had actually got Eddie Hammett that y'all now have heard of me five minutes ago, right? Kind of a big deal. I got him to come to a little church in Chabron, North Carolina. They're like, the folks asked me, how did you do it? I said, I called him and asked him if he'd come. And that's how I did it. I called him and asked him if he'd come. I, it was so amazing to me, I just couldn't imagine what he would do for other folks, right? That's how I met Todd. They said, well, you don't have enough people. We can't send Eddie Hammett for 50 or 40 people. I was like, I'll call. I said, this church will hold 350. I'm going to fill it up. I started calling every church. I just started Googling. Church I started calling. One of them was a little church in Fair Bluff called Fair Bluff Baptist Church. Reverend was Todd Padgett. You might have heard of him, okay? So, called Todd. That's how I met Todd was over the phone. He says, Sammy, I really want you to come and speak at Baptist Men's Day. I was like, Todd, you know, I've been kind of doing a funeral kick at that point. So anyway, first time speaking, kind of, I had done a testimony, kind of like Mark did earlier. And I'd <clears throat> So I went and spoke at Baptist Mid today, met Todd, made a new friend, all that. Boom. Did all the homework. Became an ordained minister. And here I am here today. Now, let's get back on topic. I'm sorry, I can just get off on a tangent. I just get excited. I'm just so happy. And, uh, it's my favorite subject. Working for God, if I could do it all over again, you know, I'd have been to seminary, dude. I really would have valedictorian is what I would have been. But anyway, instead I just skirted through high school because I hated doing homework. Never did any homework. Hated homework. So, church growth. Church growth. We are definitely fighting against it, right? It is really, really tough. There again, it's not about this church. Now I've had a conversation with Mark earlier and I can't remember what I said here and then then. My bad, Mark. The statistics are terrible, folks, against church, and it's just sad. It is sad. A few years ago, it was 90% of all churches this side of the Mississippi will close in the next 10 years. And if y'all might have noticed, I don't know where y'all live, but y'all probably have seen plenty of churches that have closed. And probably all in our own ways, if we, we care about the church, then we are thinking of ways to try to get, how do we build the church? How do we, we want couples with 2.3 children that are around 30 years old that are financially viable. We don't say it, but we hope they can tithe. Of course, we don't say it, you know. But then, if you've got a couple that are around 30s that come to the area with 2.3 children, Every church in a 75-mile radius is trying to get them, right? Everybody's fighting to get, to get them. Well, and that couple is starting to a ask questions like, okay, we'll consider going there. What kind of after-school program you got for my kids? Y'all got free daycare down there? Can y'all pick them up from the school and get them there? Can you have them? What if me and my wife's running home late? And you start answering all kinds of questions, and you start realizing that it's more like a club. You kind of want to say, hey, we love God around here. Isn't that enough? That's what we want to do. We want to love God. We want to show God. We hope you would come join with us. Tough. How, it's so hard to grow a church. Or is it? I don't know. We'll talk a little bit about it. But let me ease back to the question. The question, and it was meant to be a question, is God mean? Is God mean? All right, we all know the answer to that, right? We all know the answer to that. However... I hope we do. It, it actually creates more questions, right? Are there folks that think God is mean? Maybe. What? You know, I was, I was introduced to a quote a while back by Walt, Will, by Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman. Y'all might have heard it. Be curious, not judgmental. Be curious. So... There again, when I work for the Lord, I'm pretty bold. I ask people, hey, why don't you go to church? Why are you upset with Jesus? What in the world? And guess what I normally hear? 
they don't normally, this was supposed to be the ending, but I'm easing it in there right now. Most of the time they're not mad at Jesus one bit. They have no problem with Jesus. Guess who they have a problem with? Not God. Most of the time. Now some of them do. Now we, we're talking about a church, and I get it. And I don't want to go there. There's reasons why people get upset with God, okay? But as long as they're talking to him, at least they're mad at, you know, if they don't believe in him, then why are they arguing with him? They must believe in him if they're arguing with him. But anyway, going on a different tangent would be, most of the time that folks that are unchurched in this context have gotten upset with church people. No problem with Jesus or God, but they got a big problem with us. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So, and so much so, many of us have social media, right? You're looking on social media, and many things are kind of against God or against groups of people, different ways that are very ugly, that are very judgmental. And frankly, a lot of the unchurched are more vocal about being unchurched than we are vocal about being for Jesus. It's okay in here, but what about when we stop at the gas station or the people we work with? Why in the world are we ashamed to talk about Jesus? Very scary stuff, you know, because I'm just paraphrasing, but if you're, afraid, if you're ashamed of Jesus, he, you don't want him to be ashamed of you, right? Goodness gracious. So let's talk about this a minute. All these people that are bad-mouthing Jesus on Facebook, does he love them? Yes. Okay. But we are a member of this church, let's just say. Do we want to invite them to come to church? That's the honest, most honest answer I've ever heard. No, we don't want to. But do we get to decide who Jesus loves? Do we get to decide who gets to worship with him? It's, no. The reason we might not want to, and let's just be real honest just for one moment, is that we don't want somebody running down Jesus. We don't want to be a part of that. Now, I'm probably doing a terrible job, but I, I, I love using analogies. And I'm a big sports fan. He was trying to get me on football. I wish he got on baseball. I was a big baseball fan. So, so we're going to kind of set what we're talking about aside for one moment, and we're going to talk about baseball, of all things, for one moment. <laughs> and I'm reminded of a show called, pardon the interruption, PTI, okay? And I just turned it on one day. This was many years ago. I turned it on one day, and the topic was a pitcher for the San Francisco Giants called Madison Bumgardner. Very good pitcher, okay? But he had a very bad temper, let's say, very competitive, and his nickname, remember his name is Madison Bumgardner. World Series champion, great baseball player, pitcher, and a hitter. Well, he has the most record for pitchers hitting the Grand Slam. Anyway, his nickname was Mad Bum because he was like a stick of dynamite ready to explode at any time, right? So on this particular day, I'm just turning on the show, and this is about perspective, okay? This is about perspective. So the hosts of PTI are, are Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon, and Madison Bumgarner had hit somebody, had a bitch click, clear and brawl, something. He had been part of all these things, ejected, right? And uh, Michael Wilbon is self-proclaimed the greatest Cubs fan in the world, right? So he's got a stage on ESPN where he talks about all the time that he's a fan of the Chicago Cubs. Now, Madison Bob Gardner played for the Giants at that time. And that particular day, he had done something in the game. So Michael Wilbon is saying, Tony, it is time to make an example of this pitcher. He needs to be suspended. I'm just tired of his antics. He's hitting people. He's yelling at people. He's this. He's that. It is time, there's no place in it for Major League Baseball, his bad behavior. It is time to Major League Baseball makes an example of him. I don't care if they suspend him a whole year. I mean, he was really worked up, like pastors probably get up here sometimes. So, 
His co-host, Tony Kornheiser, said, Michael, can I ask you one question? Would you like for Madison Bumgarner to pitch for the Cubs? And Michael Wilbon said, yes. <laughs> it was amazing how his perspective changed all of a sudden if y'all followed that story. I did my best. I needed two people. I was trying to play both parts. So one minute, Wilbon is very upset. But if he was playing for his team, that would be really good. All that would be forgiven. By me and my, myself, growing up playing baseball, we had our arch rivals, okay? We are pretty lucky. In my last season, we went undefeated, won the state championship in Weifel. Thank you, brother. Not football. I was a baseball player. Mom wouldn't let us play football. <laughs> but anyway, um, later on moved into rec league base uh, softball and then church league softball. Our church didn't have enough folks to have its own team, so I start calling around. We can join with three other churches. So these guys that I played against and hated their guts... I said, hey, you want to come play with us? Well, you want your church, where you go to church? You want to, go to hey, come to church with us, or either your church could join with us. And all of a sudden, I've got a team, guys that I used to hope would strike out, or fall down, or bloop a ball, or throw it wrong. I was pulling for them. My perspective changed. It was okay when they were on our team. Now, we're on Team God here. Let's get back to this. We're on Team God, right? Team growing to church. Has God, think about God for a moment, has He ever taken someone off the other team and brought them over to His team? Think about historically in the Bible. It's New Testament stuff. Has He ever taken somebody that was absolutely against Him and brought Him over and put Him on His own team? Y'all might be thinking who I'm thinking about. That was Saul. Saul. Changed his name to Paul. Changed his number to Paul. And brought over an all-star. Right? Paul's, I love Paul. He's tough. Paul's tough, but I love Paul. I mean, no arguing that he's an all-star for, for our God, right? Guys, when you think about that situation, we would have never thought. In fact, the Christians of the day did not think it was a very good idea to bring Saul over. It's not our decision who we make feel welcome here. It is not our decision who God loves. He just took it right out of our hands. Now, I do want to share this with you. This It's amazing that Eddie Hammett's career, all the studying he's done, all, everything he's done, trying to figure out how to help us grow a church. What can we do to stay healthy, vibrant? What in the world is it we can do? What is the simplest thing we can do? All of the studying, all the books, all of this, and it all boils down to this. Inviting people to come. Inviting people to come. Inviting people to come. <clears throat> and I'm paraphrasing Eddie. He forgive me, I believe. Paraphrasing Eddie. We're not really doing it. We do it once in a while. If we feel comfortable. If we feel like they're already kind of on our side, right? But do we really do it? And I'll tell you, this was Eddie, I'm paraphrasing. Why don't we invite people? Why don't we have big billboards and commercials and on the radio? And some churches are, don't get me wrong. But why aren't we giving it absolutely our all to invite everybody to hear this good news? It's good news, right? That's what it's called, right? The good news. Follow me here. Why aren't we inviting people as hard as we possibly can? The truth is because we're afraid of who might come. Ooh. 
If we were to invite everybody then some people we don't like might come. Oh, so we might better be careful. We don't really kind of, would you come over? I ain't going to play with that too much more. But here's the thing, and this is what Eddie said. If, if that is the reason that we're not really doing our best inviting people, he said this. Guess what, folks? If there are folks that you don't like, They don't like you either. They are not coming to your church. Throw the net wide to invite folks to your church. The group that you don't like don't like you either. They ain't coming. Throw the net out there. Invite people. Let's let go of the judgment. We don't decide who is welcome in Christ's church. If nothing I say today, please invite somebody. If anybody liked talking to me, I hope everything was good. It was meant to be enjoyable. I hope. But God bless you. Thank you for letting me speak today. It's time for the, I believe, praise and worship come up and do our hymn of invitation. You may remain seated or stand if you would like and join us in singing, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow.
here today. Thank you so much for hearing me talk. Um, Y'all been welcome and I really appreciate it. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you allowed us to gather today.